magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello and welcome to Magic in the Room. I'm Chris Province. And I'm Hannah Broderud. And I am Luke Freeman. We are so glad you are with us on Magic in the Room today. We are going to start a series this month on well-being. And our whole season has been about intentional leadership, really noticing uh, where we are in our leadership journey and what is required to get to the next step. And we've talked about all sorts of leadership skills, all sorts of information as we develop as leaders. But well-being is really this critical piece. Uh, If we want to have sustainable legacy, sustainable impact, we have to be living sustainable lives. And well-being is a way to talk about that. We're really excited about it. We've got some great guests coming up this month. And as always, when we hit a new leadership topic, we have a download at magicintheroom.com. So really encourage you to go and get that reflection guide. It's going to help you uh, reflect and think about where you are regarding well-being, regarding sustainability, and give you some prompts and some reflection questions that help you follow along with us, but also get some great personalized outcomes uh, from the conversation. So those are available at magicintheroom.com. Go grab that download, follow along, and we are excited to get this conversation on well-being going. Yeah, let's get it going. And let's just kind of jump out with it um, right away and say, let's try to answer this question. What is well-being? So, um, Luke, you want to kick us off on kind of what your take is on that? And then we'll throw it over to Hannah and, and get some additional insight. Sure. And I already shared a little bit about my bias about well-being. To me, it's about sustainability. And I believe that we as human beings really have some key requirements. Um, The maintenance manual that comes with us, kind of like when you get a car and it says, oh, get your first oil change here and rotate your tires here. I think we all have kind of a a personal maintenance schedule to keep us running, uh, to keep us moving as effectively uh, as possible. And so to me, I mean, you can hear my bias, even in that metaphor, it's about moving forward. It's about development. It's about not being stuck in, you know, what in nerd world we call homeostasis, which just means like things are the way they are. They're comfortable. It's a closed system, right? To me, well-being isn't sitting on the couch and watching a show. I mean, it might be that for a couple hours or for a day if I need, need that, but it's not, oh, the more I can do that, the more well-being I'm experiencing. Um, I think we all need progression. And so well-being to me is a place where like, I have what I need to progress consistently. Yeah. I think that's a really great perspective and a great way to look at well-being. I'm thinking of, um, on one of our next episodes, uh, one of our guests is going to be Lorca. Smetana, who has been on the podcast before, but she's going to talk about well-being in the context of resilience. And, you know, one of her definitions for resilience is to have well-being over time. So we can think of resilience as an outcome of well-being. And when I think of, you know, we've looked at different definitions of well-being and we We've had some debate over those. One of the definitions is the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. And I think each of those words can contribute to an element of well-being. Um, I think, Luke, when you heard the word comfortable, maybe you were thinking more about that state of homeostasis of just staying the same, staying comfortable in terms of not changing, right? Um For me, well-being can mean intentionally putting myself in a state of discomfort in order to grow, in order to get better. But I have to be able to see that there is an end to the discomfort if I'm going to do that. Because our brains are also hardwired to avoid anything that feels like discomfort, pain, um, 
uncertainty, doubt, fear, anything that's related to fear in any way, the brain wants to avoid because it feels like a threat. And so I think when we recognize that, and maybe on a future episode, we'll, we'll talk more about how we develop new habits, right? But it's, we learn the takeaway on that piece is that we learn better through feeling good, not by feeling bad. And that's because we want to create conditions that has us moving towards something that we see as beneficial, positive, pleasurable, whatever it is. It's a feeling of something that we're seeking constantly. And so for me, going on a long trail run, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be uncomfortable. I know there's going to be moments of pain. But I also know that if I push through and persevere through those moments of pain, I'm going to experience this sense of almost elation and I'm going to feel a lot better and I'm going to feel accomplished and I'm going to feel like I got stronger and I'm going to have a sense of pleasure and well-being at the end of that. And I think for me, that's a maybe more balanced way of looking at well-being because I know I have to take care of my body after a long run. I have to give it what it needs in order to recover. And I have to focus on being well because if I just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, I'm going to break down the system of my body, right? And I'm not going to get better. And so, yes, I think there's some balance uh, as we think about this concept of well-being. It's not just feeling constant pleasure and comfort. It's maybe having that as an as a result of some hardship or discomfort. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I think my relationship with well-being, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of this answered in the statement itself. Well, what is well-being? Well, it's being well. And there's these really key relationships, I think, with resilience, with labor, with pain or discomfort. Um, and, you know, to your point, Hannah, this idea of, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of say it as now, because I don't have better words for it, working against our wiring until we become rewired yeah. because you're, you were wired not to run. Right. You know, you weren't, you weren't wired to run. I like, never went. Like, you know, that we were wired to say, Hey, save that energy in case you have to run from the bear. Right. Or even in case you get in conflict with another person, you will be more likely to survive. But like, that's not the conditions in which we live today. So, it, you know, to be, I think, to find um, fulfillment and success as a leader, it is, there's some component about working against how we're naturally wired until we're rewired to succeed in our environment today. Um, and you know, you also mentioned this idea of resilience. Like I ride along with that. It's to me, well-being is about becoming more prepared to move through whatever is going to come at me. Like, am I prepared physically to take on tomorrow's challenge? Am I prepared mentally to take on tomorrow's challenge? Am I prepared emotionally? Am I prepared spiritually uh, to? And I'm going to go past resilience and kind of accept that anti-fragility. Like, I don't want to go through something and snap back to the leader I am today. I want to process that challenge, love that experience, be comfortable being uncomfortable, and be better as a result of challenge and grow into something that's more efficient, effective, or powerful than what I was before that event started. So, um, you know, kind of being prepared for whatever the black swan events that are unexpected, that are unforeseen, that really have the most powerful impacts on our lives. It's not the stuff that we can see that molds us. It's the stuff that we don't see. And so well-being for me is about doing all the labor, doing the emotional labor to be ready, doing the physical labor to be ready, doing the intellectual labor to be ready, and doing the spiritual work required, um, and having that purpose to move through. So, um, I really, 
appreciate though are, are different kind of takes. I think all these are nuanced. I think it calls out um, that well being is dynamic, and there are you know how we process it and how we want to frame it can uh, shift a bit from leader to leader. But there are some core components that Luke. Um, I want to give you a, a chance here to speak to that relationship with comfort or discomfort and its kind of correlation to well-being or how those things play together. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I, part of the human condition is discomfort. We're not wired for pleasure all the time. Uh, in fact, when we have too much pleasure, our minds and our bodies, our chemicals do a little bit of a, hold on a second. That's not helpful. You got to be striving for something to keep us alive. So like, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and depress your dopamine levels because they've been a little too high for a while. So a uh, quick example, if people don't know exactly what I'm saying there, I, I had a cold a uh, week or two ago and it was pretty bad. And I got a little Z pack of steroids. And if you have been on those things, I mean, it is like, I mean, it's energy pill. Mm -hmm. And once they got in my system, I might've still been coughing and not a hundred percent well yet, but I was feeling good. And I was like, oh my goodness, I am so productive. I'm getting so much done. I'm in a great mood. Like the steroids were making me real, real happy. And then a couple of days later, like took the last one, the cold wasn't all the way gone. And I just had a couple of days of like real emotional melancholy. And it took me like half a day to, to understand why I was like, what am I sad about? And I kept racking my brain for like, am I worried about something? Am I, is there something that I've lost? that I'm mourning, like I was really, it took me a while and may, maybe, you know, not too quick on the uptake here, but finally, most of the way through day one, I was like, oh my gosh, this is totally my brain just resetting after not being on those steroids and just balancing out. Cause that's what it does. Like too much dopamine for too long. And our brain is like, hold up. You gotta like come back to earth here. There's hard things in life hard things that have to be done physically. You got to experience that or you're going to like pass out on the beach somewhere with happiness, not get anything done. And then we're going to starve when you don't have food, right? That's how our caveman brain thinks. And so once I realized that it was like, oh, okay. My body is just balancing out the really productive and happy days that I had. And that's cool. Like it should be doing that. Right. I can walk through this. I can experience it. I can understand that it's temporary and I can move forward. And so, I mean, that's an example of like when we are able to notice the experience that we're in, in the same way that, you know, Hannah might notice or others might notice as they're working out or running, muscles are really burning. You know what? I'm probably, I'm at mile seven, usually like the dopamines kick in or what, like at mile nine. It's going to feel really good in a little bit. And then it's going to be hard again after a while. Okay. I can, I can endure this. Like when we accept it's part of our journey and the human condition, what we can experience well-being in all of that, if we're able to let go of comfort. Yeah. And I think what you're describing is it's kind of like a dopamine hangover, right? And that is, it, it's true. That happens. And I think the question you started with, Chris, of our relationship with comfort or discomfort, um, and I want to think about especially our relationship with discomfort, what it can lead to, right? So if, if our goal is to avoid discomfort at all cost, that means either by actively avoiding it, by ignoring it, by numbing it, by basically not feeling discomfort and not be paying attention to what we're actually experiencing. That's what often can lead to some really unhelpful coping mechanisms 
like addiction, alcohol or drug addiction. It gives you, you know, any chemical substance will give you an overload of dopamine. And when you get an overload of, of dopamine over time consistently, it actually damages your body's ability to produce dopamine. And dopamine is critically important for any kind of behavior. For us to do anything repeatedly, dopamine is the chemical that actually leads to that. So for motivation, for learning, for um, any kind of like productive life, we need dopamine. And so people who are chronically depressed, for example, have very low levels of dopamine. Um, so their ability to feel positive, happy feelings um, are diminished. And everybody has a little bit different experience with that, right? Some people feel a lot of positive emotions. Other people have kind of a lower level of baseline. Um, but we all have that when things work well. But if we abuse that mechanism, it's going to wear out. So our ability to feel it naturally is going to diminish. And we need a higher and higher dose of whatever chemical to be able to do that. And so there's been a lot of research into this, um, well, you know, especially when it comes to long distance and endurance sports, because a lot of people have found um, there's a lot of people in endurance sports that have previously suffered from drug addiction or or um, depression, for example. And they find that endurance sports can actually help to repair the brain's natural ability to produce those chemicals that help us function normally. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question, right? So what is our relationship with discomfort? Do we mindfully experience discomfort and allow ourselves to go through it and move through it um, with the goal of, you know, kind of getting to the other side of it? Or do we just try to avoid it, back away from it, numb it, do whatever we can to not feel it? Um, it's just, you know, we're all in a different spot with that. And I think for di with different things, right? I can totally embrace discomfort in some aspects of life and totally ignore it or move away from it in other aspects of life. So I yeah. think as an intentional leader, just raising that awareness is helpful. Right. And that, that awareness comes from, you know, kind of breaking it into that intentional leadership, kind of giving this summary of notice my own needs and desires moment to moment. Yeah. Okay. And understand the difference between the two right? because be those desires aren't always contributing to my well-being right? or what i think i might need like is it helpful is it going to better prepare me is it going to increase sustainability is it, you know for some domain or attribute that i want in my life um so this idea notice my needs and desires moment to moment i've got to choose behaviors that meet those needs, whether they're comfortable or not, you, you know, so this, this, it's an illusion of choice if I want to be well. And that's what I love about well-being is if I have a clear purpose and I understand what I need to be well, it removes a lot of noise and it, it makes decision making really easy. But then I have to be courageous enough to, to like act on that choice to increase my own well-being, understanding these dynamics. Right. And, and, um, so many times when I speak with or coach leaders that, that are challenged, right. it's just this lack of direction, aim or objective, like basically missing purpose, whether that's big P or little P's, um, or, um, just not realizing where their behaviors are taking them, right. Just starting every day without an orientation and saying, well, I'm going to deal with today. And if that is our approach, it is very difficult to be well. I think you have to have a stronger orientation to kind of do this thing called life. And, uh, you know, it continues to become more challenging, but I'm going to want to take us on a, if 
five to seven minute off road here from, from where we've been. And this isn't in our prep or anything. So I'm going to throw this at you guys, uh, kind of off the cuff here, but we just as something Hannah was talking about there about, you know, this constant dopamine delivery being harmful and it becomes more difficult for our body to produce that. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, one of the conversations we've been having offline is this rise of nihilism, right? And, and the idea that it's becoming more difficult to stay energized, to move forward and, um, leading purpose centric lives and making these decisions is becoming harder and harder. Um, you know, how do these things, how does well-being really play with how dopamine is being delivered in our society today? Like I, it seems like almost every new product is some sort of delivery of that. And how does that affect our community well-being? How does that affect our family well-being? How does that affect my performance within roles? The fact that I'm consuming something that in massive delivery and dosage and intake could be harmful. So I'll take a stab at this. It is true that there is a rise in nihilism, which nihilism is just the philosophy that life has no inherent meaning. And so that any day-to-day -day action, experience, relationship, accomplishment, is um, at its core an illusion in any experience of positivity or negativity uh, doesn't have inherent meaning. So uh, we see this in a lot of places. We see this in kind of mental health outcomes and the rise of rates of depression. Uh, we see it in the rise of top 40 songs that have minor chords, like sad songs are way more popular now than they were 20 years ago. So there's all sorts of things happening in the culture. Um, and I'll just for a moment, like, what's the why? I think there's a lot of things playing together, but the path towards, let's just, for most of our listeners are in the United States, like the path to the American dream is a lot, uh, a lot harder to believe in than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so we have a generation now that says, I'll never be able to afford a house. I'll never be able to make as much as my parents did. And they have real reasons to believe that that's true, that the game is not winnable. And so if you go back and listen to the Hope episodes with Dr. Hellman, we know that we require a vision for a better tomorrow, a realistic pathway to get there, and then the agency to walk that path. And so what we see right now is we have many, many people who they might have a hope for a better tomorrow. They see it in movies. They've heard it uh, from their elders. They see the vision out there on billboards and on TV. But when they think about what's the pathway to get there and do I have the power to walk that pathway, it, it breaks down pretty quickly. Like, I will never be able to get there. Oh, you say I need a degree. Okay, well, the rise of cost of education as a proportion of annual income after I get my degree is way different. The equation is way different than it was 20, 30 years ago. So I can't achieve that. Why would I have hope? So that in, you know, in alignment with the, the mistrust in institutions, whether that's government, um, organizational, uh, or religious institutions, like the whole thing is in a tough spot if you're a young person today. So that's my commentary on the rise of nihilism. What does that have to do with well being? Uh, it means that we can't depend on hollow promises to motivate someone to have a sustainable, good, well life and the people who move through this from my perspective are the people who take ownership of their purpose what they want what they want for the world that they're in 
and they take ownership of a pathway to make that happen. Whether that pathway is a personal meeting with yourself at the beginning of every day, here's what I'm going to do that aligns with my per purpose and the outcomes I want to see in the world around me, or whether that ownership is, I want my career to look this way. Here are the things I need to learn. Here are the things I need to do to get me and my family or the people I care about into a different spot. And um, I, I think that has a lot to do with well-being. I think that most of the work we do in leadership development is about moving agency to the power to impact my own life and outcomes, moving agency from external. I believe that mostly it's people outside of me that have the power to impact my life and my outcomes to moving that internal, where I really believe that I have agency to make conscious choice that impacts my life experience. And well-being is no different, like moving it from an external to an internal agency on who owns and controls my experience of well-being. The more I can move that internal and have agency, I would say the more well-being that people are going to experience. And also, as it relates to nihilism, like conscious choice, am I going to believe that there's that I can create meaning in the world? And if so, what am I going to do to create that meaning? So, yeah, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. No, that's, about, that's but I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's spot on for me. Yeah. yeah, that's spot on. And I think that's, uh, I think there's a matter of choice and belief. We have to believe that it's meaningful. We have to make the choice to make an impact because it's all whether we're surface acting or deep acting, like the whole thing's a show. You know, we have these relationships that are meaningful, but we have to choose to say they're meaningful. We have to believe that those things create value in this thing called life. We have to believe that fulfillment is important. And when we isolate, when we, you know, all these voices or all the individual market of one consumption that we do, you know, it may, it tends to make it feel very isolated. I mean, as much as commerce is simple now, I also participate in commerce on my own, right? Not, not in large groups, um, like we once did. So there's, it, it's another example of the system working against us to your point, Luke, we cannot, um, count on the, any protections of legal products working against our well being. Anything we buy on our smartphone is most likely working against our well-being, not for it. And in the name of economy and commerce, a lot of things are allowable that are not helpful. And just acknowledging that I think is important, but I, you know, I want to, you know, kind of thinking through this, Hannah, why is it that leaders have to put themselves first? and take care of themselves first and in why can't we jump to taking care of everyone else first shed some light on that yeah i mean the the common analogy that comes to mind is you know on, on every every airplane when they go through the safety announcements you know and there's the announcement that you have to put your own oxygen mask on before you put on that of someone else. And that to me becomes a pretty good illustration of that, right? For us to be intentional leaders who can show up in a way that the people who depend on us need us to, we have to make sure that we are well that we can breathe, that we have oxygen so that we can help others, right? If we allow our own oxygen supply to um, to go away or to not engage with, not connect with oxygen for ourselves, right? We're not going to be any good to anybody else. And I think that's how I think of well-being in general, right? I think a leader's first responsibility is to make sure that they are well, whatever that means for them, right? that we yeah. are able to yeah, operate as 
the most effective, best version of ourselves. Well, and also I think a lot of the, and I want to start getting into habits here, but that the behaviors around how to be well, I think they're difficult to, like for us to sit here and teach someone in a PowerPoint deck about how to be well. I think that's really difficult. I think these are habits that are more socially learned. I see Hannah, I see what you do. I see your approach to life. And I, I want to have more of that in my own life. So I start mirroring maybe some of your behaviors. So I think there's a lot of kind of social learning and probably some moral reasoning, reasoning that goes into how I become more well as a person. But, you know, let's talk about those habits. How do the habits I create correlate to my personal well-being and how important is or really creating, I guess, healthy habits or well-being habits in this case? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it might be helpful to think about what kinds of habits are they? <laughs> be intentional about that, right? Um, and so anything that leads us to this state of being well over time, I think can be a helpful habit. So when we talk about well-being, often we talk about self-care, and I think self-care is an element of well-being. But there's a misnomer that self-care means eating chocolate and bought, like taking a bubble bath or, you know, sitting on the couch with a fuzzy blanket. Like all of those are things that are, yeah, I feel well, I feel comfortable in those situations. <clears throat> they are maybe rewards that we reward ourselves with, right? And they can be part of self-care and they can be part of habits for well-being, but they are not what truly creates well-being, right? Um, we've kind of alluded to these elements of physical well-being, emotional well-being, mental, um, and in that we kind of talk about cognitive or intellectual well-being, um, spiritual well-being, right? These are domains of our lives that we can think about how do we create a state of well-being within each of these. So that means for physical well-being, um, that's my physical health. That's my ability to use my body effectively, to propel myself, to walk around, to not have pain chronic pain. Um, and I think there are people that suffer from chronic pain and, and I think it may, becomes more challenging, but you can still have physical well-being, but you may have to modify, right? What, what you do and how you achieve that emotional well-being. Do I have relationships that matter in my lives, in, in my life? Do I have, um, meaningful connection, emotional connection with other human beings? Uh, mental or intellectual well-being? Do I feel like I'm learning? Am I growing? Am I expanding my mind, my um, sense of who I could become? Um, and then spiritual well-being. We've talked about nihilism and, and kind of the absence of any kind of spiritual or moral um, meaning. And I think it's a, it's an important element of human well-being is spiritual well-being, which for me has a lot to do with purpose, right? Do I have a sense of purpose and meaning? And the hopeful news in that is that all human beings, we are meaning makers, right? But if we take this back to habits, I think if we think about what are the things in my life that can lead to better well-being when it comes to each of these areas what are the things that i can do and we're not going to dive deep into habits on today's episode but really the thing to think about is when we want to change behavior because of our brain's bias towards pleasure and and the brain's natural propensity to avoid anything that feels like a threat so anything that's connected to fear, discomfort, pain, uncertainty, doubt, those are all things that the brain is going to try to avoid. So when we know that about ourselves, 
we can design habits that allow us to kind of lean into those things, right? So there has to be, first, there, there's always cue or a prompt, right? That prompts a behavior. Then the behavior itself, that's kind of the routine that we do. And then there's a reward. And the reward is always a feeling. The reward is not a thing, right? I, I get to buy myself a new purse if I do, think, do this thing. That's not what the brain is seeking. The brain is seeking that feeling, which is really a dopamine hit, right? So recognizing that, how can we design for understanding what our triggers are, what the prompts for our behaviors are? It could be time of day. It could be this feeling of internal discomfort or restlessness. It could be wanting to get some kind of release from something, right? Those are typical triggers that trigger some kind of behavior. Um, and we usually can't mess with the triggers a lot because they happen outside of our control most of the time. Um, we know the brain is going to seek some kind of pleasure reward for a behavior. Um, so what we can play with is the routine or the behavior that lead us to that, right? So that means instead of coming home from work, feeling overwhelmed, having a glass of wine, because I know that's going to release that feeling of overwhelm and help me relax. I also know that putting on my shoes and going for a short run is going to have that effect, right? Where, where it's actually more sustainable because now I'm doing something positive for my body and I still get that sense of relief or I get, I get that sense of relaxation afterwards. But it has to be, in order to be effective, we have to start small, right? Starting with those small habit shifts. Um, but if I shift my habit from having a glass of wine when I feel tired and overwhelmed to going for a short run when I feel tired and overwhelmed, over time, that's going to have exponential difference in outcome in long-term well-being. Yeah, and I, I kind of, Luke, I'm interested in your take on this. What happens when I can only deal with tiredness or overwhelm with a glass of wine, or I can only deal with tiredness and overwhelm if I have a run? Like, is there a performance constraint about having to deal with a particular trigger a particular way and I only have one coping mechanism or one solution? Sure. I mean, I think most people would recognize that the more plasticity we have in our approach to our own well-being, probably the better off we're going to be. We can't control what every day looks like. And for me, whether it's a, a Saturday at home doing chores or running my kids places, or it's a work day where I'm out of town and running and picking up supplies for a workshop and then facilitating and then doing dinner with a client, like those days look very different. There's going to be triggers throughout those days that are going to put me in a place where hopefully I'm making a conscious choice on what is it that I need. Do I need to get a project done and off my list to be able to really unwind? Do I need to pause for a minute and go hop in the pool and float for a little bit or swim some laps? Like there's a lot of different things, as, as Hannah said, that you can do. If you choose them consciously, it's probably always better than if you are directed by some sort of unseen, well-trod path in your brain to, oh, robot experienced this, you better go do this. Like that's not helpful in progressing us forward. Yeah. And that's where understanding the emotional driver behind the habit is really critical like, is it something about fear? Is it something about determination? Um, you know, and even I, you know, I can sit here and say, Hey, you know, I'm really determined. So here's why I do the things that I do. But I also like, if I dig in, if I do the real work, 
it's this fear of not being accepted or desire to be accepted that's actually driving the habit. It looks like it's driven by determination. So, yeah. you know, getting comfortable with how that shows up for me, understanding that that's the mountain that I'm climbing is, you know, I, I tend to create poor habits because I have this mountain of acceptance in front of me. And Wait a second. Are you yeah. saying emotional intelligence is important for leaders? Always, right? <laughs> like it's, oh my gosh. I think the older I get, the Stop more the thinking, presses. Yeah. It just rises and falls on that, right? Like what's driving me and yeah. how well, does that show up in the things that harm me or the habits or behaviors that harm me or the relationships I care most about? Yeah. S simple example here. And you know, Hannah, you mentioned earlier this idea of like a dopamine hangover. Um, our aim with retreats that we facilitate, so say we go away with an executive leadership team, do a couple of days, build strategy. Our aim is for that to be relationally transformative for that team as well, because that's the the more trust they build, the higher performance is going to be. Like that's not our opinion; that's just the way science works. Um. And so we oftentimes have really community feel couple days where people are being pretty vulnerable with one another, um, might maybe adjusting their roles on a team and deprioritizing something that someone's been committed to for a long time and or maybe coming away with a really exciting shared vision of the future. And we have to warn them they're you will probably the next couple of days experience a vulnerability hangover and your brain is going to start telling you stories about that was fake or now I, why do I feel bad or now, you know, this, how do I make this part of our real life? And like, that's just normal. It's just the vulnerability hangover. It's just you balancing back out. You don't got to go drink all weekend after the retreat like you could just be like oh wow that was heavy i really connected with people in a new way and that's okay like there's probably a healthy thing you can do in response to that but without that awareness like people they don't know what a vulnerability hangover is like most people right so just naming it and noticing it is more than half the work for sure yeah yeah and i think that's such a key is that conscious awareness and also the conscious awareness to the, to engage with this discomfort that I'm experiencing right now right because that is the tricky thing um and Chris you're right having more than one strategy for uh, dealing with emotional stress or whatever our triggers are is helpful we are also creatures that are our brains, there's a reason why it's always trying to make behavior habitual, right? Because it wants to preserve energy for when we really need to make conscious choice. And if everything is a conscious choice, we wouldn't have enough battery by the end of the day. And that's actually part of the truth here is we have decision-making power for only so long in a day. And it wears out like a battery. And being aware of that is helpful because we can build in habits that help us recharge our batteries throughout the day. So we don't get to the end of the day and we have zero resistance left because we don't have any more decision-making power. And that is an uncomfortable truth about how we operate. Yes, we would love to be able to put conscious choice into every decision that we make. It's just not how we operate. And accepting that is helpful because it allows us to create some different ways um, of of coping, right? And the more, um, when we are under pressure and under stress, we revert to our highest level of habit, which is why for leaders, being intentional about building habits that help us advance our purpose and help us move towards well-being is critically important. Mm -hmm because our habits are going to stay with us and we can either they will take us where we're going whether we're intentional about where that is or not 
Yeah. And I want to kind of speak to, as you scratch there, really what lies at the core of intentional leadership, it's maybe in some way, and I'm going to play with some words that I don't have fully flushed out yet, but this recognition that how can we make everything a conscious choice? Now, that's not to say we don't have habits, which are unconscious choices, but we can evaluate our habits and understand what's informing them and be conscious about why our habits exist, therefore making them a conscious choice. Like I'm, I consciously have this habit. It, it, it saves my energy because I don't have to think about it, but you know what? I've already put it through the filter. I know that it it kind of clears all the hurdles for like what creates sustainability or what creates preparedness for me and my life. And if it's not a habit, then it is something I need to evaluate. And I don't want to accident myself into a world of having the glass of wine every day at 530. I don't want to accident myself into running a 5k every day for no reason. I want to <laughs> know like, why am I doing these things and, and being aware and, and having that emotional awareness that, that what Luke was saying, um, because leadership is lonely, leadership is uncomfortable. And how can I ever tackle the level of loneliness and discomfort if I don't believe? And so I don't want to soft sell the spiritual or moral kind of energy required to lead. We have to believe something in order to guide the conscious decisions. We have to have a picture of what we want our life to be. And if we don't answer that question, much like businesses, like if we don't believe something about the business we're in, if we don't believe something about the life we want to create, then it's really difficult to be effective because there's no direction to our energy. So, you know, those are kind of my final thoughts as we think through you know, well-being and, and why it's important and, and how we go create it within our own lives. Uh, but I'm interested in what's on your mind as we get out of here today. Yeah, and just want to pick up on what you laid down right there, Chris. I think it's, I mean, that's the crux of this whole thing, right? For me, it's going to be what is, how am I intentional about the habits that I form in my life? And how do I make them a conscious choice? So being intentional about well-being for me means being intentional about which habits I develop. And I want to pay close attention to what those are because they're going to lead me somewhere. And it better be, I'd rather it be on purpose and where I want to go, right, than on some accident. Um, getting into a place I didn't really want to end up. Yeah. And for me, this is well being is all about where do I want to be? Kind of like Hannah said, where do I want to go? And for me, I want to progress. And when I am in a, a space of well being physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, I progress faster. I'm more creative. Um, my relationships are healthier and that's only good. And I have a story in my head that says the more productive or the more, the more I grind, the better my outcomes are. And this whole conversation is just a re-anchoring to this idea that no, my outcomes are actually better when I'm balanced and sustainable. That doesn't mean no times of hard work. There are lots of times of hard work, but it means that there's sustainability and balance built into that. And for me, I mean, my, my gauge is creativity. Like it, it only shows up when I'm in a space of well being. It's the first thing to go when I get out of balance. Um, but for me, it's like, a, it's a really important outcome, uh, just from a values perspective. And so it's sort of my canary in the coal mine uh, for well-being for myself. And I just love how you said that, Lou, that my outcomes are better when I am well. Like, mic drop. 
Yeah, exactly. I think we probably all have that thing that goes missing. Like there's, there's some core part of us that we value a ton. What is creative creativity for Luke? For me, it's probably humor, you know, it, it, and it's this thing that just drops off the minute we're lacking that balance or sustainability. And so let's, you know, I'd encourage our listeners to take that inventory and for sure, go download that guide at magicintheroom.com as we move through the rest of this time together, because I know there's things that we didn't talk about today that we want to dive into, which is, you know, well-being as that enabler of development, the responsibility of leaders to uh, develop well-being within others. And then how do we move through with, you know, some of those basic um, ideas of being well aren't there. If we're hungry, if we're not cared for, how does that affect um, our ability to move through as well? So those are just some of the themes we'll be uh, kind of diving into as we get along the past year. Um, thank you guys for, for always being such amazing thought partners. I leave today certainly better informed and, and taking some serious inventories about where I am right now. Like where am I in this minute and what are some things that I can, I can action or habits that I can, uh, work through or create that might move me in a new direction. And so kind of with that, Luke, do you want to let everybody know how to find us? Yes, you can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com or LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook under Purpose and Performance Group. Uh, we would love it if you would pick up your phone, rate the show, leave a review, share it with someone that you think might benefit. Um, and I will read us out. Magic in the Rooms, hosted by Chris Province. Hannah Broderud and Luke Freeman. It's produced by Ben West. Social media management is by Emma Holland and Maggie King Robinson. Our theme music is by Evan Grimm. You can find his music on Apple Music. This episode was recorded remotely from Oklahoma and Montana. Magic in the Room is a production of Purpose and Performance Group. You can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com. And you can go find previous episodes and download the guide for this month at magicintheroom.com. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Hannah. Until next time here on Magic in the Room. Have a great day.